uh, you're, <laughs> everybody's, everybody's good to go uh, for the talk, I hope. I um, want to thank everybody for coming. This is by far, by far the largest attendance at uh, one of these events that I have had. So welcome to the, um, the uh, first meeting of Controversies in Church History, which is this uh, monthly church history course I am uh, giving here at Our Lady of Sorrows slash Our Lady of Hope, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and um, tonight's uh, topic is the fonts of Reformation, so I'm going to give a talk. I'm going to try to keep it to an hour. Uh, I, I know way too much about this topic, but I'll give a talk. That's basically what happens. I give a talk. When you guys have any questions, um, you can come pick my brain and see what you can get out of it. Uh, hopefully more than, you know, rats and sawdust and stuff like that. So, um, and so if you don't know, this is... Um, 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 this series is, we have three more classes that will meet after this, so every month, once a month, on the last month, last Monday of every month, we'll have courses, basically uh, taught during, during the school year, academic school year, so basically the A B year, essentially. So you're free on Mondays, you're free to come or not come, tell your friends. Um, I'm offering this course more or less uh, as, this is um, um, a service to the church and to uh, uh, my community here, so but uh, anybody's basically welcome, uh, essentially, and um, and uh, so yeah, and so tonight's topic is on. Uh, and by the way, oh yes, I mentioned advertising. Uh, my Facebook page, Controversies in Church History. Check it out. We have the the um, uh, schedule of courses, schedule of talks, um, videos. These are all being recorded. This one's being recorded. I post them all on on Facebook. So if you can't make it, can't make one, you can uh, listen to it. All that stuff. So. Um, and so, yeah, and uh, just some of you, I've met most of you already, but just to reiterate, uh, I'm Jared Taylor. Uh, I teach history at Johnson County Community College. And, um, and this is actually one of my, I want to say my favorite topic, one of the topics I've been most invested in in my life for personal reasons. I won't tell you why initially, but uh, the Protestant Reformation is um, a topic you should know a lot about as Catholics. Uh, you really do need to know. Uh, probably more than uh, you do know, I think, uh, a lot of ways. Hopefully, and this is what the, this is what this is going to be is a very broad overview as much as I can, and then hopefully uh, I can answer whatever questions you. I hope you will have questions. Hopefully, it will spark those in your mind. So, uh, and that is one last thing: try to save your questions until after the talk. Um, so when we get done, we'll have time. I tend to get kind of in a zone when I'm, when I'm talking, so I want to try to I want to get this uh, uh, done as quickly as possible so we can do that. So. Um, so the lecture, Protestant Reformation, how faith divided uh, the Western Church, and the uh, way I set these talks up is I set up in terms of questions that I answer, because uh, I want these talks to have some sort of apologetic value for you. And so the first question we're going to get to tonight, okay, what was the Reformation? What happened? Uh, what was involved? In and that's be a lot of background on that. That's what I specialize in is history. Secondly, uh, I'm going to go through some of the reasons why historians uh, think it happened. And again, I um, as you're going to see, I, I don't believe in Catholic, don't, don't get me wrong, but I am trained as a secular historian, so I, I'll present these things in a fairly neutral way. Uh, as you're going to see, I'm not neutral about um, the outcome of the Reformation in a lot of ways. We'll talk about some of the reasons why historians think this happened. Um, was the Reformation necessary? This is a question you will get, probably, from people. Was the Reformation necessary? We'll get into that uh, a little bit here. Um, one thing I actually am going to talk about just because, well, you're Americans, <laughs> and uh, American Protestantism, in fact, modern Protestantism is going to be very different from what you're going to hear about in this lecture. Uh, the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century is um, probably not what your Protestant friends believe in a lot of ways, and I'll explain hopefully why that is. Um, and then finally, does it still matter? Um, and by the way, the answer to that is yes, of course. Uh, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't, but um, you need to, I think you need, I need to explain why a little bit, why it is uh, still important for us uh, to note all these things. So those, that's the, the outline. So let's get started. So a definition. So what is the Protestant Reformation? What, what was it? And basically, it's, it's kind of complicated because things in history are complicated. Um, but it's a schism in the Western Church that begins in Western Europe in the 16th century, and there are a lot of things involved in this, but the way I teach this, the way I understand it is, you have a disagreement, a conflict, over uh, the nature of salvation. Uh, Christians, more or less, even West, definitely West, maybe even East and West, you know, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, 
had a general idea that they agreed upon, like, okay, what do we do as a Christian in order to live a good life and go to heaven? What's going to happen in the 16th century is going to arise a very, very contentious debate about uh, how this occurs and what you need to do. And this is going to lead to a permanent division of the Western Church into uh, actually more than two camps, but the Catholic and the, uh, generally the Protestant camps uh, from the 16th century onward. Um, it's necessarily, because this is a theological dispute, it starts out among theologians, gets to the general populace, it's going to cause lots of political and social disruption. Um, why? Because, well, and this is the next thing I have to talk about, just about the late medieval church, because you've probably heard things about the late medieval church. One thing to note is that, this is a historian I'm quoting here, is the omnipresence of the church. The church is kind of everywhere. Um, when you talk about, like, your whole country, you talk about, well, our whole society is this or that. Church was the society in the Western Europe and the Middle Ages. There was no outside the church for the most part. Um, every village, every town you go into it's of any age in Europe will have a church at the center of it. Uh, it is literally the beating heart of everything. There's no aspect of life that the church is not really involved in the Middle Ages. So the first thing to note is we're not talking about, it's kind of hard, it's hard to understand actually at first. So we think, okay, the church is, you know, you have a secular life, you have a religious part of our life. It doesn't exist in 1500 when this starts. And it's hard to get back to, but it's everywhere. Uh, and it's involved in virtually everything. Um, the second thing to note about the late medieval church, uh, this means it gets into bad things, uh, and bad things happen in the medieval church. Um, this is not, by the way, the first schism that has occurred, not even close, uh, in Christian history uh, by the time you get to the Reformation. And I'm leaving out the stuff in the ancient world. There were several schism schisms in the late Middle Ages. In the 1370s, there was a schism. You had different popes being elected. Right, we had at one point not just two, but three different popes being elected. This was eventually solved by the beginning of the 15th century. We had a schism uh, in the uh, 15th century when uh, I, uh, a church of a particular country, the Church of Bohemia, broke away from the Catholic Church. It was eventually brought back in, uh, eventually to uh, within the, uh, the you know, the part, into the uh, Catholic Church and reconciled. Um, there were heretical movements um, that were. Um, Pretty popular in the Middle Ages. Um, movements which meant to challenge the church's teachings about Christ, about orthodoxy, uh, which more or less, they more or less rebuffed than the church did um, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, and they would pass. And there were plenty of scandals. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Uh, the question usually arises, I'll come back to this, was there corruption in the medieval church? And then my answer is, of course. Uh, if you haven't noticed, there's corruption in it today. Um, there is always corruption in the church. Um, was it any better or worse than any other time in history? It depends on who you ask. Uh, there were things going on, I'll get to them in a moment, uh, about, uh, especially about uh, the Protestant Reformation that kind of flow into it. Uh, I'll say this, um, there have been worse times in church history than the late Middle Ages. It wasn't quite, uh, again, there's a sort of, and I hate to say this, you live in a, what was very recently a Protestant country, Sometimes you get this uh, impression that people in the late Middle Ages were the worst of all time, all the popes were evil, nobody believed in the... It's not really quite that cut and dry. In fact, there's actually a lot of good things going on in the late medieval church. Um, and that kind of gets to my other point about this, is that there were uh, responses to these corruptions, such as they existed in the latter part of the Middle Ages, um, going back several centuries that were already trying to address some of the concerns people had about religion in the latter part of the Middle Ages. Um, one of these, by the way, uh, has to do with humanism. You know what humanism is. This is the movement that begins in the Renaissance in the 14th and 15th centuries. People going back and studying uh, classical text, Greek and Latin text. Going back to the sources, that was the phrase they used, ad context, to the sources, to the sources. Uh, most of these humanist reformers were Catholic and wanted to use their learning to sort of, again, um, try to um, uh, simplify um, the sort of devotional practices that were present in late medieval Europe, make them more biblical centered, make them a little simpler. Late medieval church would be very elaborate in a lot of its different um, uh, liturgical and um, other matters in ways that were yeah, off putting to some. Um, you also have reform movements uh, springing up throughout uh, Western Europe. Um, movements like the Brethren of the Common Life, which was a religious order that sprang up in the Netherlands. If you've ever heard of the book uh, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas of Kempis, it comes out of this movement. I mention it because it's a movement that includes both uh, clergy and laity. 
one of the problems people complain about uh, sometimes in the late medieval period is that you have a, a fairly strong sense that the clergy thinks of itself as being superior to the laity. It's not universally true. Um, uh, in fact, there are a lot of these reformers going on. There are reformers trying to sort of change the church in the late uh, 15th century, um, well before the Protestant reformers get past this. <laughs> One thing I do have to explain um, is the topic of indulgences, because if you know anything about the Reformation, probably you think you know what it has to do with this. Um, indulgences, if you don't know, um, are basically in lieu of, if you do uh, religious acts in order to, um, you can do in the Middle Ages, this idea comes from the Middle Ages, uh, you know the doctrine of purgatory, that you have to purify yourself of your venial sins before you get into heaven. Um, the church uh, developed this idea that, okay, the church basically has the merits of Christ within its, uh, within its bosom. It can sort of allow you to sort of work off some of the time you have to take spending, you know, purifying yourself and going to heaven through doing acts of penance, right? This is penance, the idea that you um, go on pilgrimages, you do extra prayer, you do extra acts of mortification. Um, starting with, if you took my class, you'd know this, but with the Crusades, they started to accept money in lieu of this for a variety of reasons. Um, this, of course, led to certain abuses. People complained about this for a long time before uh, the Reformation. Although, for the most part, people, uh, I should mention, most people, this wasn't actually the sort of flashpoint for the doctrine of purgatory in the Middle Ages. Um, th this type of thing, indulgences, were kind of secondary toward, uh, compared to uh, the major thing that uh, promoted purgatory was the uh, pray uh, prayers for the dead, uh, masses for the dead. That's where people spent most of their money and gave most of their money to the church was through that, that, uh, that, um, um, that sort of uh, devotion rather than indulgences. But there were complaints, a lot of them. Um, <coughs> specifically, humanist reformers didn't like them very much. Uh, they didn't like indulgences, they didn't like uh, pilgrimages, they didn't like, um, they didn't like external things. Uh, they were very text centered. They wanted everything to be about the Bible and be very simple. Um, I should mention also, for the most part, we're going to talk about the papacy and indulgences. Most indulgences were issued by bishops at a local level. And by the way, they did issue them for the most part, well, not for the most part, they did issue them in uh, certain circumstances for monetary reasons. That is to say, they invite people to give money to church, you know, for, you know, for, you know, penitential purposes, so they could build a bridge in their local town or something like this. And people were fine with it. So it's only the abuses of it that become, and there are some bad abuses in the Middle Ages that make this an issue. Um, I can say a lot more about the late medieval church. I need to get on with this, but my point is there's not necessarily, um, this isn't, this, you wouldn't expect if you're living in 1500, this would be this flashpoint that would split the entire church going forward. I don't think, anyway. I want to show you a map to give you an idea. Has anybody here been to Europe? A couple of you, one or two of you? Okay, how about half of you? That's great. So, um, what we're going to focus on here, this is Europe in 1500. Uh, there's a few big kingdoms uh, Spain, France, England. And then you have this in the center of Europe, the Holy Roman Empire. If you don't know what this is, um, the Holy Roman Empire is a, I put this, it's sort of like, it's uh, an elected monarchy. Uh, it's not very centralized, uh, and it's elected by princes. They're called prince electors. Some of them, by the way, are bishops. Uh, and it's made up of a bunch of little tiny states. I'll show you another map in a second. This is where most of this is actually going to take place, the Reformation I'm going to talk about here in the 16th century before it expands out. To give you an idea of what I'm talking about, this is the Holy Roman Empire about 1512. Just so you don't even know any of this stuff, uh, you can just take a look at all the patchwork of states. It's not unified. And uh, even though the Holy Roman Emperor is he's called the Emperor, he's crowned Emperor, he's supposed to be the successor of the Roman Empire, technically speaking, um, he doesn't have, in fact, that much power when it's pushed comes to shove over a lot of these princes. You need to keep that in mind because politics plays a lot into this. Uh, and the place we're going to be talking about here, especially, is Saxons, right dead in the center. Saxony is where all this will start, essentially. Uh, in the 16th century. Um, and it starts with a German monk named Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther was from a mining town uh, in, uh, in Saxony. His father was a, uh, uh, made his money in mining, actually made a pretty good living, actually. Um, I guess if you put it in modern terms, he'd be sort of like middle class, maybe upper middle class. He had a pretty decent upbringing in that regard. Um, and uh, Luther, when he was a young man, uh, was going on a journey somewhere. I don't know if he was going to go into Erfurt up or not. Uh, got caught in a rainstorm, and uh, he was so terrified by the thunder and lightning that he 
made a vow to St. Anna, who was one of his favorite saints, that if he survived the storm, that he would go into the priesthood. Uh, he survived the storm, he went into the priesthood, and became a monk uh, at the University of Erfurt uh, in, um, in Germany, which was a small, uh, studied there in Erfurt, and um, becomes a professor of uh, theology at Wittenberg University, which is a small, brand new, more or less brand new university uh, in central Germany. And Luther, um, while he was there uh, at, uh, at uh, Wittenberg, <coughs> Uh, began to have uh, issues with, well, among other things, indulgences. Um, as he would put it later on, he had began to have uh, problems with the whole idea of good works. Um, because he went into uh, the monastery, he was an Augustinian monk, uh, expecting to, again, you know, the idea was this was a more holy form of life, you do all these penances, it would make you holy. Uh, and he struggled with this a lot. One of the big, big things throughout his life is that he struggled with uh, worries and doubts about his salvation. Uh, was he going to be saved? Would God, did God hate him or stuff like this? These things got into his mind from an early period. Uh, and as he tells it, he began to read this letters of St. Paul in the 15, he's uh, uh, teaching at Wittenberg by the 15, uh, teen, uh, 15, 15, 15, 16. He says through his readings, especially of the letter to the Romans, that he began, came to the conclusion that basically you could do nothing to save yourself that faith alone was the thing that would actually save you. Um, and then in particular, he was one of these, and he's not a humanist per se, but he's one of these academics who had a real problem with uh, indulgences, particularly abuses of indulgences. And so if you've heard anything about him, you've heard about his 95 theses. Uh, in in uh, 1517, he actually wrote up a list of 95 theses against for the most part, by the way, the, the abuse of indulgences. Um, and by the way, he was criticizing someone in particular, a man named Johann Tetzel. Johann Tetzel was a, um, he was a seller of indulgences. He was licensed to go around um, getting people to give money in uh, exchange for indulgences. And he had a pretty b bad reputation because he used some very extreme rhetoric uh, in trying to sell these indulgences to people. Um, you've probably heard the phrase, I can't remember how it goes, but you, as soon as you, as soon as the I, there's actually a rhyme. It's pretty bad. As soon as the uh, as soon as the coin goes into the bank, your your whatever your um, your deceased relative will get out of purgatory. Basically, uh, he said worse things than that. By the way, I won't repeat them. You can ask me after. I'm going to put this on film. Uh, things were really racy. Um, they complained about this loudly. Um, one thing to note about this, by the way, um, he proposes as a debate. And if you don't know anything about medieval um, universities. This is a standard practice that you you, know, you live, um, uh, draw up a list of things for debate, you post it somewhere, and um, you announce, hey, let's have a debate about this. It's an academic um, uh, procedure. It's nothing, there's nothing controversial about it. And in fact, there's really nothing controversial about the 95 Thieves. They're a little racy, they're a little bit impudent. He was very impudent, uh, like Martin Luther, but um, they're perfectly orthodox, actually. You can, they're easy, they're not that, really not that, um, uh, not that, what I'm looking for. They're not that subversive, if you want to put it in those terms. Uh, in fact, by the way, um, we now, most historians think, he never actually posted these theses. Uh, probably, I've actually repeated this story in my lectures for years, so I guess it's not nice to know that I've actually been wrong doing that. Uh, he never did actually uh, post them anywhere. And there was no debate, essentially. Uh, and in fact, part of the reason he printed them, by the way, is he actually sent them to, and this is, by the way, proper procedure, he sent them to the various bishops, his own bishop, or other bishops, uh, trying to alert them to these uh, problems with this um, seller of um, indulgences, who, by the way, the reason why it's controversial, Johann, Johann Tetzel was licensed um, to give these indulgences because he was making money for Albrecht of Mainz, who was the archbishop, uh, was the bishop of uh, Mainz, who was trying to pay back a loan, long story short, that he had made to the Pope. The Pope was rebuilding the Basilica of uh, St. Peter's in, uh, in Rome, uh, the one you see now being built, the old one was being sort of done away with, and uh, they were using this in some ways to finance that building. Again, I mentioned this kind of went on a local level, it wasn't that big of a deal. It was a little bit underhanded, some of the things that went on, but this is one of the things he's complaining about, Martin Luther, um, in his 90s. He doesn't actually arrest this in his thesis, but it's behind his, um, behind his complaints. Um, and what happens is um, Luther goes very quickly from criticizing the abuse of these indulgences to criticizing the, the indulgences themselves. Um, and in fact, 
basically, uh, it takes a long time. One of the things that happens is he doesn't get a lot of response uh, from these bishops. And if you're wondering why the bishops are just ignoring him, uh, you, you do know because you're in part of the Catholic Church, it tends to move very slowly. It's a big bureaucratic organization. Uh, but well before he gets any sort of uh, any sort of uh, reply, he starts preaching, and he starts saying things like indulgences are worthless. He starts attacking the whole idea that you need to do good works at all um, to um, basically to gain salvation. In other words, he goes from not just attacking okay the abuse of indulgences, you shouldn't do this, you can't buy salvation, to no, nothing you do uh, can contribute anything to salvation. Uh, and it's basically uh, the devil's work, essentially, that you believe that you can do anything otherwise. People are basically completely sinful. Uh, and what happens is um, he begins, uh, and not only preaching, he prints some sermons. And he does this, by the way, in a pretty concerted way, prints his sermons, present, prints these things. Um, to the extent that in the 1519, 1520, he publishes three um, works. Uh, one of them is called The Freedom of Christians. Other the letter to the German nobility, other ones the Babylonian captivity of the church. Those are the three that actually mark his open break. He starts criticizing not just uh, indulgences, but the whole idea of, well, first of all, papacy, which he begins clearly identifying with Antichrist. And he says this over and over again, pretty much in everything he writes after 1519, that the Pope is the Antichrist, because he is uh, essentially um, promoting false doctrine. Uh, he attacks the whole idea that the church can, in some ways, through the sacraments, dispense grace to people. God works through faith alone. We'll get to the faith alone in a second. This is King Martin Luther. Um, it's nothing external. Uh, faith comes from hearing uh, the word of God. Um, there's no external, basically. Everything else is essentially negotiable. Um, and he is condemned. Uh, literally, they uh, issue a bull, the Pope does, in 15, I think it's in 1519. Uh, Exerge Domini, basically condemning him as a heretic. Uh, and so what happens is he begins, uh, and by the way, one of the things about Luther is that he very, uh, he has a close relationship with the elector of Saxony. This goes back to that political part of this I was talking about. He's one of the princes of Germany. Um, that's his region. Saxony is his, uh, the kingdom he resides in. Um, it's his protection that kind of makes the Reformation possible. Um, and uh, he's called some of the Rome to answer charges of heresy. If he'd come there, he probably would have been condemned, probably would have been executed for heresy. Uh, instead, he gets the elector to, uh, to uh, brook a compromise. Instead, he'll be called before a, a meeting of the imperial, what's called the Diet. The Diet's like uh, Parliament. A meeting of the princes of Germany. Uh, and be tried before the emperor, the whole Roman emperor, Charles V, who... Um, was in many ways an impressive figure. He was only 21 years old when this actually happened. He was newly crowned the king of Spain, which had, the, had a big empire at this point. This is the most powerful man in Europe, but um, he's called before the Diet of Worms. Uh, actually, Worms is the way you should put it. It's not like a, like a South Beach Diet. Uh, this is a Protestant Diet. You eat worms, and then you, uh, then you go to heaven or something. No, um, Diet of Worms met in 1521, where if you know anything about this, they, they expected him, they, they ordered him essentially to recant his beliefs and condemn the things he had written. Famously, by the way, he had uh, help from um, people around the Elector of Saxony, um, uh, instructing him how to answer and everything. And he famously, when he was uh, called to give an account of what he believed and what he did, he, uh, he ended with the phrase, basically, um, I will not go against, uh, I, I, I messed up in my head, I've forgotten the actual phrase. Um, I will not go against my conscience or the word of God. If it can't be proved for me from the scriptures alone, I will not believe it. Princes, popes, and councils of error, etc., etc., um, and uh, it's not safe. To, and the, the part, by the way, we're not really sure actually happened. The famous phrase is, "Here I stand; I can no, do no other." God help me, Amen. Uh, that was added by one of his his own side actually, who wrote down the account of what he said. Uh, so basically, he refuses uh, and essentially condemns anybody. And by the way, we'll get this in a moment. He literally meant if you didn't believe what he believed, if you believed at all that you had, that you could, you know, contribute to your own salvation, you were damned. <laughs> I'll get back to this in a second. Um, and so the next day, uh, Charles V gave his own speech condemning Luther. They basically said, yes, he is a heretic. Um, uh, it's actually an interesting set of speeches. You can read them back to back. Um, uh, and he's condemned. The reason, by the way, why he uh, gets away with this is Charles V even though he condemns, by the way, condemns him to be very specific. It's not a, a, an ecclesiastical condemnation, it's a political one. He's the emperor. 
Uh, he condemns him as an outlaw. Basically, anybody who grabs him and takes him back with him will be rewarded for this. Um, he could have grabbed him right there and executed him, and that would have been the end of things. But Charles V had uh, guaranteed, given his word to Luther, he'd give him safe conduct to and from the, from the Diet of Worms. Um, and that's the only reason he survived. If, that had been, if this had been, by the way, Henry VIII of England, he would have just grabbed him right there and killed him because Henry VIII had no conscience. Uh, but Charles V was an upstanding guy. Uh, as soon as he left uh, Worms in 1521, he was actually, quote unquote, kidnapped, was Luther, by uh, Friedrich of Saxony, his, uh, his patron. Basically taken into custody so to keep him from being, um, from being um, killed, essentially. Uh, and he was kept in a castle at a city called Wartburg in uh, the 1520s. Um, and this is usually when people date the beginning of the Reformation. I'll come back to this in a moment. Um, because he's managed to get um, the support of the uh, town council and the sort of town fathers of Wittenberg on his side. The university is on his side. And one of the things that's involved in all this, I'll come back to this with the empire, is that there are cities and towns in the empire who are, how can I put this, they're very independent minded. They don't like people telling them what to do. Uh, and the idea that they're going to be able to reform the, the church. And this is one thing to explain. One of his uh, works was um, Letter to the German Nobility. He basically said if the church hierarchy won't reform the church, laymen should do it. And by laymen, he meant princes and governments. This is why I did this in a second. Historians call the period after 1521 when he's condemned the magisterial reformation. He appeals to the magistrate or to the civic authority to do what the church allegedly won't. Uh, and I should, this is the thing to emphasize here, if it wasn't for this protection, the Reformation would never have gone off. Uh, it needed state support. There were, by the way, areas where it was very popular, but they were always a minority, as you'll see, I'll talk about this. Um, it could not have succeeded any, it would not have, it would not have been a permanent schism without this protection of these uh, princes. And so um, he spends the next couple of years, uh, well, the next year, I should say, in, um, in seclusion, I think about a year basically, where he's living in this castle incognito. He's dressed like a nobleman. It's pretty funny actually because he's not much of a nobleman. Um, and by the way, if you don't know that, that is one of his later pictures up there on Martin Luther. Um, but his ideas don't stay static. And by the way, I mentioned his idea. I'll come to the major points in a second. Uh, he wasn't just attacking the, the whole idea of the church. He was attacking. I mean, he was attacking in some ways the whole idea of free will. Uh, this is one thing he literally says, you have no free will, essentially, with regards to salvation. You can do nothing. You are basically, uh, you're a slave of God, essentially, the devil, whichever one you're on, whichever side you're on. And, um, but he also used the language of freedom a lot. His work, The Freedom of a Christian, this was his idea of um, freeing himself, or a Christian was freed from the law, right? Freed from, the gospel frees you from the law. He's never very clear on this, but he... Um, he means the law of good works, right? You don't have to follow any laws. It frees you from the old law. It frees you from, uh, and he, you know, he thought of uh, the uh, the church hierarchy in, being, in terms of being Ferris, Ferries, and stuff like this. Um, and like he, one of the famous phrases of his uh, his work to uh, freedom of a Christian is, a Christian is the most free lord of all, uh, free lord of all. I can't remember how it goes. It's free lord of all and servant of the, both free and unfree at the same time. Is the basic uh, point of this. Um, most free lord of all, but servant of all, something like this. Uh, what happens is people begin, uh, as soon as he goes into hiding, take his ideas and run with them in very radical directions. Um, you have uh, theologians taking the idea, because one of his other ideas, of course, is that scripture alone, this is Polo Scriptura, is the sole authority for determining doctrine. Um, Luther read this in a particular way, uh, and by the way, throughout, to the end of his life, basically anybody who disagreed with him was literally on the side of the devil, I'm not kidding. Uh, virtually every debate he ever got into, I mean, he condemned not just the Pope as being the Antichrist, he would condemn his fellow reformers if they weren't on board with his exact interpretation, interpretation of things. Um, and sometimes you'll get modern historians who want to make him this precursor of, you know, modern freedom of conscience and individual. He didn't believe that, actually. He believed that there was only, it wasn't an interpretation, the Word of God was just so clear, the Bible was so clear, um, and if you got it wrong, you were just literally you, you were under demonic influences. Uh, people, of course, took this idea. They took the example of what he had done and went in wildly different directions. One of the directions they went, this is the, what the Peasants' War comes from, is uh, you had these peasants. Peasant uprisings were fairly common in early modern Europe. 
Um, this one was different, 1524 to 25, because they explicitly appealed to Luther's theology. They appealed to this idea of the freedom of a Christian. And their reasoning was, oh, their reasoning was my phone, no. Um, their reasoning was, uh, if he can throw off the Pope, and we're not, we're not bound by the law anymore because we're freedom, because we, grace makes us free of all law, why shouldn't we throw off our landlords and our, uh, our overseers in the secular realm? Uh, and um, they rebelled. And by the way, they actually had some real serious grievances. Um, the, the landlords weren't necessarily just. Some of these, by the way, I should mention this about the church. Some of these landlords were monasteries, things like this. Um, the church was the biggest landowner as a whole in Europe. So they did have real grievances. Um, Luther rejected this idea out of hand. I mean, he literally, very violently, with violent language, condemned uh, these peasants. Uh, and he encouraged the uh, emperor, which he did. Uh, to brutally put down his uprising. It was very, it was really ugly. We're talking about, you know, stories of soldiers like stringing people up in trees and, you know, stuff like this. Really horrific scenes of violence. And uh, Luther later on would basically claim that God told him uh, to go, um, to urge the authorities to punish the wicked this way. This is something, this is the way he began to talk more and more to the end of his life. It wasn't me doing this, it was God doing this. And this is, again, part of his, his outlook. Again, if you don't believe you have free will, you're not responsible for anything you're actually doing. And that was one of the lines he took in terms of the peasants' war. Um, and so you have his ideas, this is, I'll get to the theology in a second, uh, causing real serious social divisions. Um, this kind of came to a head uh, in the debate he had with the, uh, the humanist, the Darius Erasmus, if you know who that is. Uh, he was a Catholic, he was a reformer, uh, he was one of the great humanists of the early modern period, actually. Uh, someone who was like Luther, critical of the institutional church in the latter part of the Middle Ages. Someone who was critical of indulgences, pilgrimages, stuff like that. Someone who wanted a more simple sort of piety based on the Bible. And so for a long time, Luther uh, kissed up to him, trying to get him on his side. Uh, and by the way, Erasmus was famous all over Europe, so people were waiting to see what he had to say. He didn't weigh in until 1524. When he did, uh, he basically weighed in uh, against Luther. And in particular, he defended the idea of um, our freedom of will, especially with regards to salvation. And his major point here, and this is one thing we get about Luther, is that um, uh, he defended the traditional doctrine, which is, okay, you do have to, and by the way, Luther, in his emphasis on um, you know God's grace alone saving us, is basically correct. Uh, we don't save ourselves, we can't. That doesn't mean we, <laughs> we're free to do whatever we want. It doesn't mean we don't have to strive to be good. Uh, and this is the, part of the argument Erasmus makes against him. It makes nonsense of the whole idea, which we get from the Bible, that you're going to be judged on your actions when you die, basically. Um, and Luther's response to this is very, very... It's amazing, actually. Um, at one point, Erasmus and his... And Erasmus wrote a very small pamphlet. Luther wrote a whole big book replying to him. Luther couldn't help himself but write the big books. Um, when Erasmus pointed out that if you took Luther's doctrine literally, because what he wanted to say was that everything we do is determined by God, Luther says. Erasmus basically says if you take this seriously, it means that God is causing you to do evil. And uh, Luther in the bondage of the will uh, says exactly that. You're right. God actually forces us to do evil through his, through his over... And this is, a, this is one of the big things about Luther is he was... I'll come to this in a moment... The reformers were worried about uh, this idea that you do all these good works. You do all these pilgrimages. You do this stuff. You know, you do your prayers and all these other sorts of things. It looked like, to a person like Luther, that you were trying to sort of, how do you put this? It looked like you were almost sort of cheating your way into heaven by doing all these little things that don't seem to matter. It seemed to, it seemed to suggest that you didn't need God, basically. Um, and to defend that position, he took some extraordinarily extreme, <laughs> extreme positions, and that's really one of them. Uh, and so you have this idea um, um, uh, that you have no free will being defended and uh, pushed by Luther to these extraordinary extremes, um, which is the opposite, of course, of what uh, Rasmus wants to say. Um, and I go back to the, the, the uh, rest of the Reformation in a moment, but... One thing to note about this is that Luther almost immediately, partly because he can't control what he started, I want to say he takes a back seat. He's, he very quickly becomes less radical than the rest of the people around him. He's actually fairly conservative. Um, uh, I'm sure most of you have friends who are Lutherans or know some of their Lutherans. The, the Lutheran churches tend to be the more conservative end of Protestantism. Um, once he had made the break with Rome, he wasn't, 
he put it this way, he had no use for letting people interpret the Bible the way they wanted to, I can tell you that. Um, and he generally, again, he had a more famous view of things like the Virgin Mary. He still had a very, uh, fairly you know, robust devotion to her relative to the other reformers. Uh, he was okay with images in churches. Most Lutheran churches had bishops, which, again, not quite the same understanding as Catholics, but they retained a lot of these things. Because uh, once the break was made, he was very insistent, by the way, that he was the person who made the break. All the rest of the reformers should listen to him. And they didn't. But uh, he sort of took that line. Um, but the main thing, the main legacy I would I'd point out to him is that he got away with this. This is the big thing about Luther. Once it was sort of seen and he could sort of break away from the church and give a rationale for it. That's the other thing I'll say about Luther's. We'll come back to this in a moment. Um, I don't know how it sounds to you. The first time you hear this, most of my students when I teach this, I tell them, you know, Luther's ideas that we're all basically, you know, we have no free will there. They hate the idea. And by the way, if I have, I have Lutheran students who tell me how much they hate Luther. It was a really weird experience to teach this class but, uh, in college. Because um, it's not, by the way, what most people actually believe. But um, there are reasons why it, this might be an attractive belief system. I'll come back to it. But uh, it sets the table for everything else that happens. And just to sort of elaborate more generally on the key points of the dispute, one of the big things, especially that motivates Luther, but all the rest of the reformers, to John Calvin in a moment, um, is this idea of the sovereignty of God. It goes back to what I just talked about how the idea of everybody doing indulgences to work off you know, sin, people going on pilgrimages and stuff like this, it seemed to suggest God wasn't all powerful. And a lot of late medieval thinkers uh, tended to view theologians like Luther, tended to view God as if he were some sort of absolute sovereign, like he was a a sort of universal monarch, right? And any sort of hint that he wasn't all powerful was some sort of derogation uh, to his power. Um, uh, literally, basically, they, they, the view was so extreme, the idea is if God is free, we must be totally unfree. If he has free will, we must have none, because wherever God is, we can't be there, essentially. Um, and this contrast, by the way, with his view of how sinful he's been, it, this, he has a and again, this is actually not this is actually nothing particular to uh, Protestantism. A lot of late medieval Catholic thinkers thought of people as being very, 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 you know, sinful in a way that most of us we don't we may say that, but our default position isn't, yeah, I'm a I'm a worm on a dunghill. Luther said things like that and believed it. Um, Calvin said things like that and believed it. And so there's this dichotomy between the, the greatness of God. They had a very high view of God in all the reformers, and a very low, very low opinion of human beings. The second major um, point of dispute is this idea of sola fide, where you, by faith alone, right? And the idea is, of course, you receive the faith, and that's kind of sort of it. Um, again, the Catholic view, of course, that you have to do good works. Um, again, you don't save yourself with these good works, that's not the point. Uh, but it's a sort of a phrase that comes from um, St. Thomas Aquinas, faith formed by charity. That is, your faith is reshaped by this uh, by acts of charity that you do. So you do contribute to this in some way, even if it does, it's not the actual effort that saves you. Uh, and Luther gets rid of this uh, completely. This is the big thing, of course, they all want to emphasize to these um, reformers, uh, which goes along with sola scriptura, which, again, these Latin, I'm using these Latin tag phrases because these reformers use these Latin tag phrases. It means by scripture alone. Um, you only know of the faith. You only know, you only uh, understand um, Christ and his saving grace through scripture. No other sources of authority are allowed, essentially. Um, Luther, in the beginning, was um, someone who um, was receptive to the idea of church councils, um, but very quickly uh, turned against those, and basically rejected any sort of authority, living authority, if you like. You know, the church is a living body that exists through time. No, it can only be the, only be the book. And this is something, again, uh, there are some precedents for this, but so far this is a novelty. No one had ever thought, for example, you could just have everything in the book, People read the Bible for centuries, right? Uh, but no one ever thought that. And the Bible, of course, is the unique record of Revelation, but uh, it never existed by itself in the way that uh, Luther and some of these people thought it should. Um, this, of course, has impact on the whole nature of what the church is. And this is something actually, if you know anything about it, uh, Luther never really bothered to define um, what the, um, what the uh, church was. And he took various stances toward this. Uh, in his debates with uh, Erasmus, one of the things Erasmus said, well, I'm quoting all these authorities who are public authorities, church councils, popes, stuff like this. Um, 
you know, where is where is the church? And this is the, this is the usual Catholic response to Luther in his lifetime and afterwards. Is, well, where, where was the church if you? Because the way that well, the reformers uh, told the history of the church was, well, it fell into error at some point after the death of the last apostle, after the sometime several centuries after Jesus. Then we rediscovered it. We rediscovered the true gospel, and the critique went, okay, where was the church? They would have various ways of coming up with this, um, a response to this. One way was to say the church had become invisible, that it was only an invisible body of believers, that could, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, other reformers took a, again, they had to really twist uh, a lot of history to get uh, an answer to this. Uh, but it meant essentially the floor of the church was downplayed, because you don't really need one if, you don't, <laughs> if there's no authoritative interpretation of scripture, of sacred tradition, if there's no um, living uh, body guided by grace, there's really no need for it. Uh, and so it becomes um, it becomes a secondary issue, actually. Um, at least, well, at least for Luther. And then you get to people like John Calvin; they'll take it very seriously. But um, one other thing that this uh, Reformation pits um, uh, in terms of a, a conflict is individual experience versus tradition. Um, because uh, Luther, even though he says he's not doing this, is actually what he does. Uh, he basically pits his own experience of reading scripture against the course of tradition of the church. Uh, this is where you get, I'll talk about the radical reformation in a second, people will take his message and go, okay, if you can do that, so can we. And you say, okay, we're not going to have uh, uh, popes because it's not in the Bible? Okay, we're not going to baptize infants because it's not in the Bible. These are called Anabaptists. Uh, Luther condemned them wholeheartedly, hated the whole idea. There's nothing in the Bible about uh, baptizing infants, by the way. Uh, they had a point. Um, so, um, but one of the things that people very quickly do is they start saying things are, um, one of his former colleagues, uh, Andreas Karlstadt, who was a professor with Luther, became radicalized by his teaching, almost made the Bible irrelevant. They put such emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Well, if you have the Holy Spirit, you can read the Bible correctly. And there were other, other people saying, you didn't need the Bible, you just needed the Holy Spirit. As long as you got that, you're saved. So you can take this very subjective idea that Luther had. I'll come back to this. Um, it is uh, rooted in his experience, and if you pit your own experience against tradition like that, it's going to make things very, well, it does make them very complicated because everybody has different experiences of things. Um, and so this is one of the big things, that, key points of dispute they have, because people are going to explain, hey, we actually have the Holy Spirit, church says no, uh, and so you have this division over this. Uh, the result of this, by the way, this is a, a picture of map of the Holy Roman Empire, I showed you one in 1512. This is the Holy Roman Empire by 1555, and you can see how much it's been sort of split apart. And that's because you're having it break down into different Lutheran, I'll get to the Reform in a second, Protestant principalities, Catholic ones. Um, it splits Germany uh, in a real big way. And by the way, it's not one single entity, Germany, but uh, it splits the German states in a big, big way uh, as a result of all this. Sorry about that. Um, and just to give you an idea, by the way, um, the effect this has when you and, uh, when you um, when you take that idea of you know solo fide, no no uh, no good works, uh, it basically makes nonsense of the mass um, because of course one of the things you know that's primarily God's work, right? Uh, it's His sacrifice, but it's also ours. Uh, and Luther's a strange one, by the way. He actually kept the belief in the real presence, but denied the whole idea of transubstantiation, denied the idea there was a sacrifice going on the mass. Um, this is a, a, an altar from a Spanish mission in, in uh, Arizona. And you can kind of see, of course, um, I want to show you, I, I, I'll show my uh, students in American history this to give them an idea of what Protestant Catholic looked like. Um, it's the high altar there. And again, if you believe, of course, that that really is the sacrifice of Calvary, that it really is the body and blood of Christ, there's no altar you can make gaudy enough <laughs> uh, to make it magnificent enough to, to contain that reality. That's why you have these in a, Catholic, a traditional Catholic church this way. Um, the way these things look. This, of course, is a um, congregational uh, meeting house uh, from New Hampshire. This is Puritans, uh, New Hampshire, uh, New Hampshire, old colonial style church, which, of course, the, as the phrase goes, is you know, four walls and a sermon was a Protestant worship service. Because, of course, there's no, there's no more real presence, there's no sacrifice. It's just a place for a guy to give a speech and then a meeting house, and that's it. Um, and again, when you change that, it really changes the way not just what you believe, but how you practice the faith. Uh, and it does this fairly quickly. I mean, people, um, Luther's different, uh, but a lot of the reformers, most of the reformers will take all the images out of churches. Um, 
There's a lot of um, outbursts of iconoclasm across Germany and other places, destroying statues, destroying icons, stuff like this, because those are all things that are, well, they're, they're demonic now, right? You know, they're, uh, they're evil because they um, seem to come from this uh, corrupted uh, church. So how do things go after Luther begins all this? Um, briefly, I'm going to go over this. And, briefly, I'm going to try to go over this um, without getting into too much detail. I mentioned the Magisterial Reformation. This is when Luther and then other people will appeal to the princes of Germany. I'll also appeal to the cities of Germany. Um, one of the big um, Protestant areas that emerges uh, out of um, uh, the Holy Roman Empire is the Swiss Confederation. Um, the Swiss, of course, are a group of little cities, uh, cantons, they call them. Uh, not all of the cities of Switzerland go over to the Reformation, but a lot of them do. Uh, and again, they're fiercely independent. They sort of break off in a different direction. Um, in fact, a lot of people go in, uh, especially with Luther, as far as Luther is uh, concerned, um, they abandoned him on the, the notion of the sacrament before anything else. Um, that's when he initially falls out with the rest of the reformers. He actually has a, um, a meeting at Marburg uh, in 1529 with a um, man named Holger Zwingli. He was the sort of leader of the Re early Reformation in Switzerland, where they argue of the nature of uh, the Eucharist. And Luther clung stubbornly to the idea that Christ was present somehow in the, the bread and wine. Pretty much all the rest of the reformers went the opposite direction. Uh, they said, look, if you, don't, if you want to get rid of and, uh, I should have mentioned this, one of the things, of course, Luther gets rid of is the whole idea of uh, the priesthood, like the, there's a more sacrificial priesthood. Well, if you don't have a special priesthood for a special sacrifice, you don't need to have a, you don't need to believe that that's actually a sacrifice, you're not sacrificing it anymore. And so most of these Protestant reformers went with the idea that the Eucharist is merely a, a memorial ceremony. Uh, you're remembering Christ's sacrifice, you're not making it present, uh, as you would in Catholic theology. Uh, and so you're going to have this division, uh, uh, again, I'll show you the map in a second, reflected in Germany. But you're also going to have a lot of uh, even more radical reformers take his ideas in crazy direction. Um, I mentioned some of them already, some of the things they went through. Um, but you would have groups, um, you would have people doing things like letting women preach, um, based on the Bible, based on their interpretation of the scripture. You would have certain people who uh, preached what's sometimes called antinomianism. This is the idea that, again, you're not bound, you know, this is, goes back to Luther's rhetoric, you're not bound by law anymore, the gospel saves you. Uh, and so some people, you know, advocated things like, this may sound crazy, free love, polygamy. You're asking how do you get that out of the Bible? Um, if you're already damned anyway, or if you're already saved anyway, right? If it's not within your control, it doesn't matter what you do. So, again, you have people going in those weird directions. You've got other people embracing polygamy, by the way, because it's in the Bible. Uh, and again, this is something, uh, uh, things kind of got out of hand. They especially got out of hand in a place called Munster. Uh, Munster was actually captured by a group of Anabaptists in 1534, if you know what, I've mentioned Anabaptists already. Uh, the Anabaptists are called, that, that term means rebaptizers, and they disagreed powerfully with the idea of baptizing infants. The reason why? Um, because they thought only someone who could make an actual self-conscious act of faith could be baptized, they had to be an adult in other words. So they rebaptized adults who had been baptized uh, as children. And by the way, if you're wondering why, the, and this by the way, everyone hated at the Anabaptists. Catholics, uh, Protestants, and the reason why is that uh, baptism was not just your entry into the church in the Middle Ages and the early modern period. It was your entry into civic society. You were a citizen if you were baptized. If you were a Jew, you were not. So to say that someone wasn't properly baptized was like saying that you could go take their property because they don't own it anymore. <laughs> it was a really shocking thing to say. Um, but these Anabaptists who captured the city of Munster were millenarians. They thought the end of the world was coming. And they literally captured the city and set up this crazy sort of, I don't know how to put this, um, David Koresh-like <laughs> uh, commune where they, they, they introduced things like polygamy and stuff like this. Um, and they were so threatened by this, the uh, Catholic and Lutheran princes of Germany actually banded their armies together to uh, lay siege to the city. Um, and over about a year, they laid siege to the city. By the way, while this was going on, the uh, Anabaptist leaders, because they thought the end of the world was coming, took a bunch of their prisoners, people who they thought were their opponents, and started executing them left and right, because they thought, well, God's going to come down and descend and save us, the end of the world is coming right now. They eventually, um, um, the siege uh, wore down um, the Anabaptists. They broke in there and laid waste to them. Um, but it shows you where this thing could go in really crazy directions. 
Um, and some of these people, by the way, were, uh, again, the Anabaptists, if you don't know, uh, some of their descendants are actually, I believe they're Mennonites in Kansas, if I'm not correct. Those are descendants of the Anabaptists. Uh, a lot of them went off in directions, um, more admirable directions, I should say. I don't want to, to, to um, make this too lurid, but uh, they went in directions nobody would count at the time, certainly, uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, they also began um, having people who were more systematic in their thinking than Luther develop uh, ideas for the, the Protestant movement. The most important person is this man, John Calvin, if you've heard of him. He was a Frenchman, a uh, humanist, and a lawyer, who, um, unlike Luther, who was, to say the least, not a systematic thinker, uh, Calvin was. Calvin was a brilliant thinker, actually. And he took the insights of Luther about sola fide, about all these you know, uh, Protestant doctrines, and turned them into the first systematic exposition of Protestant Christianity. Uh, first published in 1536, it's called the, the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Uh, and it's important because it gave a coherent blueprint for, to what Luther had taught. Luther did nothing of the sort. Luther left no uh, writings behind to tell people, okay, this is what the faith is, now this is how you run a church. Um, he was not a really great organizer. Uh, he was more of a preacher than anything else. John Calvin was a brilliant administrator and a brilliant uh, thinker. He was also a really, really brutal SOB who got invited to the city of Geneva uh, in the 1540s to take over the Reformation and run the church in Geneva, if you don't know. He tried to create, well, essentially it was a, a mini reformed church in miniature in the city of Geneva. It became sort of a calling, a center for people who wanted to reform the Christian faith in the Protestant world uh, because it was so, uh, it went a lot farther um, than uh, Luther had in uh, getting rid of bishops, getting rid of stuff like this, um, getting rid of the hierarchy in the church. Uh, he didn't believe in the real presence, stuff like this. Uh, and creating this sort of, you know, quasi totalitarian state where there was this very heavy handed regulation of society, people's, you know, uh, personal lives, stuff like this. Uh, but it was popular, uh, again, partly because you could actually, unlike Luther, you could actually copy it and take it elsewhere. It was sort of portable in the way his thinking wasn't. And, uh, and then finally, the other sort of major offshoot of this, and I'll go through this uh, not in too much detail, how much time I have, I need to get done, um, even though this is actually my specialty, um, is the Reformation in England, which if you don't know, emerges out of the uh, dynastic situation of Henry VIII of England, who was married to Catherine of Aragon, uh, who had a daughter with her, but um, if you don't know, the Tudor claim to the throne was a little bit shaky. Uh, he wasn't sure anybody would actually follow a queen if he left her behind to rule, so he desperately wanted a male heir. So he petitioned the Pope to give him an annulment because he had married Catherine, who had been betrothed to his brother, who had died before they consummated the marriage. Uh, the Pope refused for a variety of reasons, and so, and in the 1520s, uh, Luther, uh, Henry VIII, who had uh, attacked Luther, by the way, one of his published writings, um, began looking around for ways to get himself uh, an annulment or a divorce, basically. And so, uh, with the connivance of the Parliament in England, he had a bunch of legislation passed, which made him the head of the Church of England, uh, which gave him authority, made him literally the Pope, basically, in the own country, uh, but didn't really reform the Church that much during his lifetime. He basically gave himself a divorce. Um, long story short, um, he raised his son in a more rigorous Protestant faith. He did make a lot of changes uh, in the five years he was alive. He was only in his 20s when he died, or 16 when he died. He was a very young boy. He didn't do much. Um, then his Catholic daughter Mary came to the throne, and this is where I don't have time to go into this. She did actually execute a lot of Protestants for heresy. Uh, but she died after five years, and that's when his daughter Elizabeth I took over and created what amounted to a sort of compromised church. Uh, because by that time you had been through like 20 years of like sort of Protestant, really Protestant, back to Catholic, uh, and created what's uh, later times have come to be called a via media in England. It's essentially a church that looks a lot like, looks more like, uh, to a certain degree, like uh, the Catholic church, it had bishops. Uh, Elizabeth I herself liked, if you like, high church type of liturgy. Um, but it still retained sort of quasi reformed emphases, um, mm -hmm. rejecting good works, rejecting the Pope, stuff like this. Um, a little more ambiguous legacy with regards to uh, the church in England. Uh, and this is where you stood, uh, just to give you an idea, this is about 1600, uh, by the end of the 16th century. End of the 16th century. Uh, you can kind of see the green areas are where um, areas that have remained Catholic. Um, and so you kind of see 
most of the continent actually remained Catholic. Actually, it wasn't this way in the middle of the 16th century. Uh, for a time, parts of Eastern Europe were actually went were actually Protestant. The Catholic Counter Reformation, which we won't talk about here, managed to bring them back into the fold. It's mostly in uh, the north, in Germany, uh, Prussia, Scandinavia, Denmark, Norway, Sweden. Uh, some parts, and the yellow, by the way, are Lutheran countries. Uh, the purple ones are Reformed, they're Calvinist. Uh, in the Low Countries, in the uh, Netherlands, some parts of Central Germany, and Scotland, uh, which had a, re a revolution in 1560, 59, I should say. They overthrow Queen Mary, uh, the uh, Stuart King there. Uh, but you see, you probably can't see it on the map here, all these other little letters represent pockets of minorities in every other country, though. And virtually every country had a large minority of some other different type of um, Christian denomination at that point. Uh, so by 1600, the whole, uh, the whole, basically the whole of Europe had been sort of divided on this issue. Uh, one of the things that happens that uh, historians talk about uh, in this period is what they call confessionalization. What that means is um, after the initial wars were fought in the 1550s, Protestant and Catholic in Germany, um, they were kind of a stalemate. So they came up with this de facto rule for determining what would happen religious-wise in these countries. Uh, it's a little Latin tag phrase that's... Um, Says quius religio, uh, quius uh, regio, aius religio. Basically, it's whoever the uh, the ruler is, whoever the prince is, that's the religion of the state. So even if the majority of your uh, population is Protestant, he's Catholic. Catholicism is the official religion of the uh, of that particular state, or vice versa. Uh, but it only applied to Lutherans, because the Reformed churches weren't a part of it, and the Lutherans wanted to keep them out. Uh, but this meant that increasingly you had. Um, you had the Catholic Church, but also these Protestant churches, putting a lot of emphasis on doctrine and really making a real big effort to catechize people like they hadn't before. I mean, common people in ways they hadn't before. So when they talk about confessionalization, that and you have people's political policies being really tied to confessional. Um, um, and by confession means, by the way, uh, pretty much what, what that sounds like, a confession of faith, because all these different Protestant churches put together these confessions of faith to, you know, uh, to uh, how what they believe. So you have a split in Europe both between Catholic and Protestant, but also between Lutheran and Reformed. Um, divisions within Protestantism were, um, were pretty um, um, evident from the beginning. You also have, and I'll only mention it in passing again, uh, the success of the Catholic Reformation. Um, the Council of Trent, fall in 1545, ends in 1563, does remedy a lot of the abuses, the problems of abuses that had emerged in the late Middle Ages. Um, too late, but it does have some success. It, uh, new religious orders are created above all the Jesuits in the 1500s who have some success. They're the one of the ones who are going around trying to combat Protestantism, basically, in the latter part of the 16th century. But you also have lots of conflict. Um, particularly, you have a series of bloody, brutal civil civil conflicts starting in France in the 1560s uh, between the uh, Protestant population, the Reformed, the Huguenots, you know who those are. Um, and, um, and the Catholic population, I won't go into it too much detail, pretty brutal, um, really brutal fighting, um, which didn't come to an end until the end of the century. You have religious revolts in places like the Netherlands, which, um, again, the Netherlands was the northern part of uh, the province that was ruled by Spain, which of course was Catholic. Um, they revolt in the 1560s, takes them several decades, they eventually get recognition of their independence, but it's inspired by Calvinism. Even in England, which never has, um, they're never attacked, uh, they are attacked by Spain, but then they never come to anything. They have a series of civil wars in the middle of the 1600s, in which um, it's mostly a matter, of, well, it is a matter of politics, parliament versus the king, but there are also serious religious tensions between those two sides. And so this reformation, you know, battle over the meaning of Christianity, what it means to be saved, all this stuff, gets into the internal politics, even of Protestant countries, uh, and causes a lot of these conflicts. But the big one that really kind of brings all this to an end, brings the Reformation to an end, is the Thirty Years' War, which uh, starts in 1618. Again, it starts in Germany. Uh, I mentioned the Holy Roman Emperor, right? You have this uh, elected monarchy. You have uh, rival claimants to the throne. One's Protestant, one's Reformed, actually. The other one's uh, Catholic. And so you have this tension over, okay, who's going to come to the uh, who's going to come to the throne? A uh, Catholic leader uh, comes to the throne in 1618. Uh, and this leads to tensions which break out into war. Um, and you have, by the way, for the first 10 years or so of the war going against the, the Protestant princes of Germany, 
until there's a big shift uh, in the middle of this. Um, well, uh, the country of Sweden actually enters into this on the Protestant side, but you also have the Kingdom of France entering into the Protestant on the Protestant side in this religious uh, war, basically. If you're wondering why, uh, because the major Catholic power was Austria, they didn't want the Aust Austrians dominating Europe, so it's partly a dynastic thing as well as a religious war. Uh, and it ends, it doesn't, they don't fight, by the way. There's several different pieces in this uh, 30 year period, but on and off for 30 years, which devastates Germany, uh, which ultimately is a stalemate. Um, this is the main upshot of it. It was pretty brutal, but people in the 16th and 17th centuries were used to brutal wars. The main thing was neither side could, uh, could win. And this is usually marks the period where people talk about the end of the religious conflict. There is, that there really aren't any more confessionally driven wars after 1648. But it also marks the, the end of the period of the Reformation, uh, partly because in Germany they leave the status quo in place. They, they can't do anything better. And more or less the religious lines are left in place as well. The division, religiously speaking, in Europe becomes permanent with the end of the Thirty Years' War. And so what are the consequences of this? One's obvious, the division of the Western Christian world, uh, basically permanently. It's been divided this way ever since. Another uh, consequence of this, uh, I haven't had much time to get into this, but the conditions for things like modern religious pluralism, um, but also relativism, uh, are created by the Reformation and its fallout. After, seven, after 1648 and the 1700s, uh, people begin to, again, it's once you can't have, uh, once you have no unity like this, it becomes natural for people to think of, uh, well, religious truth can't be, it can't be known. Otherwise, it wouldn't be this sort of disagreement, right? That tends to be, it doesn't actually cause this, but it creates those conditions pretty clearly um, uh, coming out of the 17th century. Uh, and increasing in intellectual terms, intellectuals, scholars, begin to look to uh, look for non-religious alternatives for the basis of things like society, for the basis of things like, okay, how to run a government. I need the enlightenment. Uh, it leads to people looking for alternatives. Because, hey, if this is nothing but a cause of dissension and <laughs> war, this is no good, right? Uh, it's what has that effect in a lot of ways. There are some more positive elements of this. The church did reform itself eventually. Uh, again, in response to the Reformation, the Council of Trent was successful, I think, in some ways. Uh, we established the Catholic Church to establish seminaries for the first time. We had no seminaries before the Reformation, uh, which, of course, raised the sort of education level of priests and things of this nature. Uh, and you could probably say that they, the, the Reformation spurred Catholic missionary efforts to a certain degree because. Uh, you know, of course, um, it's the Jesuits uh, who go to places like India in China, places like that in the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, would have been no Jesuits without the Reformation. Um, so it has a huge impact in those, in those terms, uh, in terms of the consequences in the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, in terms of what it did then. We have the question, of course, uh, why did all this happen? And I've kind of hinted at some things here, and I'm not going to go over individual sort of works, but they're basically, I'm going to say they're basically four ideas that historians have as to why it happened. And the most basic of these, I'm calling the corruption thesis, and you've probably heard this. Basically, this is not always a Protestant, Protestant view of the Reformation, there's a Catholic version of this. Uh, the church was so corrupt, uh, things were so bad, thank you, uh, the church was so corrupt, things were so bad, it needed some sort of revolutionary change in order to overcome those corruptions. Um, I can, I think I, I, you've, I've already hinted this, I don't really buy that, that thesis by itself. Things were bad in some places in Europe, uh, in the latter part of the Middle Ages. And I should mention this, um, just to give you an example why, um, uh, uh, about Martin Luther. Um, a lot of abuses in, uh, of indulgences in Germany but um, they really weren't that, the, uh, the abuses really weren't that notorious elsewhere uh, in the Western Christian world. Uh, and uh, Martin Luther would have, would have known this. He left Germany once in his entire life to go to Rome when he was a monk. Uh, and for the most part, he stayed within a 90 mile radius in Germany his entire life. He had no idea what the church was like in, say, Spain, which, by the way, um, the Spanish bishops were very much influenced by humanism. They did not allow the sellers of indulgences into their territories. <laughs> Uh, so there wasn't a problem there. Um, you have people like Chaucer making fun of indulgent sellers in the Canterbury Tales in England, but it was never that bad there. Um, 
the kingdom of, of Norway and Denmark who went Lutheran, there was no particular problem with indulgences there. Uh, my point is that uh, I think the corruption thesis is overstated. It doesn't explain, there's plenty of corruption in the church 200 years before that, no reformation. So it doesn't explain that idea, basically it's a meme. The second idea I'm calling the, the evolutionary thesis. And the evolutionary thesis is that there were changes long term in the offing that sort of led to the reformation. And it's sort of a natural outgrowth of that. What types of changes? Um, for example, there's a, um, I mentioned reform movements at the end of the Middle Ages. Uh, one of the things that happens at the end of the Middle Ages, there are a lot of um, writers in, in late Middle Ages writing mystical treatises, writing books about mystic, their mystical experiences, how to have, how to engage in contemplative prayer, get to mystical states of contemplation, and things of that nature. Um, I can list off names, I don't know what they mean, to you, Marjorie Kemp, uh, Julian of Norwich, a uh, bunch of them in the later part of the Middle Ages. And there used to be some thought that, well, this meant that, you know, this goes back to the corruption thesis, but um, certain historians interpret this to mean that, well, people are looking for individual experiences because not getting what they need spiritually from the institutional church. In other words, it's sort of like a um, uh, uh, implicit condemnation of the failures of the, uh, of the, uh, of the institutional church. However, a very, very, very good Protestant historian, Heiko Obermann, took the opposite tack. Uh, he thought that, the, that this flowering of mysticism was actually a sign of positive change at the end of the Middle Ages. Uh, he called it the democratization of mysticism. Uh, and the reason why is if you have all these laymen, and they, a lot of the people were laymen, who were internalizing um, the uh, teachings about prayer they got from monks and from priests. Uh, my point is you can see that in a more positive way, and they, he wants to see that as feeding into the Reformation. Uh, again, I'm not quite sure about that, but it, it's, a, it's a different take than sometimes you get. Um, plus, of course, it, the whole idea of an evolutionary thesis sort of presupposes you know where things should have gone. Um, and this, by the way, was. There were certain things we were going to change anyway. One of the things that happens um, with Luther, I mentioned his dependence on princes and the civic authority. Um, of course, a lot of these princes um, appropriated ch church property. They, they took it, uh, made it state property. Um, they took over things like charitable charity, uh, care of the poor, all went to the state in these uh, Lutheran uh, kingdoms. Um, some of this stuff would have happened anyway. Over the long term, the, the early modern states, they were going to become modern nation states, I think, one way or the other. I don't think the Reformation caused that. They were probably eventually would have taken over a lot of the functions that the church had done in the Middle Ages, because they were becoming more powerful, um, they had more money, more resources. For a long time in Western life, in the Middle Ages, the church was the biggest, wealthiest, most capable institution. That was going to change anyway. Uh, but it's hard to say that this was an evolutionary process that was sort of going that way. There were some trends that played into it. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily buy the evolutionary thesis that it's going toward this, uh, this particular end. Um, the third type of thesis I'm going to talk about is the revolutionary thesis, which um, Again, you're going to have, again, kind of two different, almost a Catholic and a Protestant version of this. This is because most historians who wrote about this for a long time were either Catholic or Protestant and had very strong uh, confessional um, um, views on this. Um, the one hand, you, see, you, you could see this uh, most probably powerfully in parts of Germany, uh, a revolution from below, uh, the revolution of the people who, you know, they rose up against the, the hierarchical church and the hierarchical emperor, right, and, you know, threw off the... Uh, medieval church and made their own reformation in places like Zurich and these you know, German uh, uh, city-states. The problem is, for the most part, that, that, that was probably the only place that happened like that. Uh, most of the time, it happened from the top down. Uh, of course, you can see that from an opposite perspective. You can see this as a top-down revolution, and this is the one I know best. England's the perfect example. It was, for the most part, people used to think differently, by the way. It used to be in the older historiography among academics that People thought, wow, medieval religion was bad. That's why people, that's why, and the, the reason why they thought this is because nobody, it didn't seem to be a lot of opposition to Henry VIII. Uh, people just went along with it. Most historians in the last 30 or 40 years have overturned that completely. Most people were perfectly satisfied. Uh, with the, not, okay, I shouldn't say perfectly satisfied, but most people were not looking for this revolutionary change in the middle way, the part of the middle way. It was, in many ways, a top down, uh, top down change in places like England made with the, the connivance of elites, the court, some of the universities, people who had newer theological ideas that wanted to get them into circulation. 
Um, that's part of it. It was, however, even in England, there were areas where it was popular. Minority areas, to be sure, but it touched um, a lot of people's uh, desires for a simpler form of faith, more biblical. It did, although there were people who had those same desires who stayed Catholic, so it doesn't explain everything. Um, and kind of in the upshot of all of this, I'm trying to explain why it happened. Um, and I wouldn't want to wait, by the way, I don't want to uh, seem like I'm uh, making excuses, by the way, for... Uh, Catholic leaders at the time. Uh, a lot of them didn't do uh, their jobs as well as they should have. Um, but I tend to explain a lot of the major changes I, I, I teach about in my classes the same way. Maybe, maybe it's wrong, I don't know. Um, but I tend to think that when you're looking at, first of all, I think you could get the idea now there is no one explanation for this change in historical terms. Uh, big cataclysmic changes generally have multiple causes. They have multiple things flowing into them. Uh, I call it a perfect storm. Um, what I mean by that is it's a bunch of different factors that turned on things that could have easily gone the other way. I mentioned one of them already. Um, um, Luther basically getting out of the, uh, the Diet of Worms alive. Uh, I, 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 I mean, I'm flippant about it. I mean, literally, I mean, if he died there, I think the Reformation would not have happened. Uh, and again, a lot of rulers in the Middle Ages, they didn't keep their word. <laughs> Charles V was a really upstanding guy for who at that time was probably the most powerful person in Western Europe to keep his word like that. Um, if Luther had been a different person, uh, come back, I just read a biography of Luther, so I have this in my head. He was someone who most people today agree had some sort of emotional disorders. Um, depression, most likely. Uh, suffered from severe bouts of melancholy, what they were called melancholy in the 16th century. Uh, he reported later in his life having blackouts and stuff like this, you know, passing out. Um, he certainly, by the way, every biographer mentions this, he had issues, very serious issues with his father. And you don't have to psychologize. I don't like psychologizing people in the past because they're dead and they can't protest this, but if you wanted to see his rather virulent attacks on the papacy as attacks on a paternal authority or a substitute for his dad, uh, if you read enough of his speeches, it sounds like he is lashing out, and you know this is a product of uh, his own personal demons. Uh, literally, by the way, he did think he got visited by the devil. So um, this is something uh, Luther actually believed um, in a pretty strong way. And so, um, again, all sorts of things. If he hadn't, if he hadn't made that vow in that storm, is it from a priest? What happened? My point is, it's a, it's kind of a near run thing. Um, what this actually happened. Uh, I'm not sure we can actually sort of grasp it in merely historical terms. Which gets me to the one another, uh, a fifth question. Was the Reformation necessary? And I will say this. Yeah, reform was necessary uh, in the 16th century. Um, the, you know, the Catholic Church recognized that belatedly in the Council of Trent and did make the changes necessary that it did. Um, the problem is, of course, that the Reformation wasn't really reform. Um, it wasn't performing an existing structure, it was getting rid of it to solve a problem. Um, uh, and um, again, I have to, you know, I, I, I wish I had more good things to say about Martin Luther, but I don't have a lot of good things to say about Martin Luther is the problem. Um, I find some of his ideas to be rather, um, especially the idea about um, the lack of free will, there's something very, very troubling about that. Um, it seemed to me, I think it's pretty obvious, and this is what people complained about in the Catholic world, is it takes away your personal responsibility if you're not, you don't have any free will. Um, uh, the idea that you, nothing you do matters, it's kind of, it's a, it's a psychologically fatalistic way of looking at the world, which I think is, um, I, I think it's the counsels of despair, actually. Um, and so I think it undermines essential things about the faith. I think, uh, again, to put it in blunt terms, I think Luther was wrong on a lot of the big disputed theological questions. Uh, that's why I became Catholic uh, as an adult. So um, I do want to say certain good things were brought about by this. Uh, by Reformation. Like I was saying, uh, every person was a bad person that was involved with a reformer. Um, I do think that about Luther. Uh, not Henry VIII, maybe John Calvin. Actually, John Calvin too was a pretty awful guy. Uh, some of them were actually conscientious, upstanding people you could admire uh, in personal terms. Uh, I have much more sympathy with later reformers than I do with, uh, with Luther and Calvin. Um, the Protestant emphasis on the Bible is something I am, I am, um, I embrace. I think it's great. Um, the em uh, emphasis on you know um, simplicity, on all these other sorts of things. A lot of things the reformers wanted weren't necessarily opposed to the faith at all. 
it. Um, but it undermined things that I don't think you can undermine uh, in the long run and still, uh, uh, still keep the face. Um, and I've kind of hinted this already. I think reforms might have taken place. I say might have taken place uh, if this had not happened. Again, there are no guarantees. Why? Well, because we have free will, <laughs> unlike uh, Luther's wrong, and so there's no guarantee it would have happened. But there were there was already there were actually changes for the good already going on. Luther with his um, was a really angry guy, uh, very angry actually, with his angry impatience with the with the church and with the world. Um, I don't think you had to do what he did. I don't think you had to do what the rest of the reformers did. Um, yeah, you know, they might have not lived to see those reforms come to fruition. You know, we all want reform in the church. You may not live to see them come to fruition. Um, doesn't mean they're not coming. Um, and so I, I think uh, we have to view the Reformation in that sense, and I'll come back to this as a failure. Uh, I don't think it did what it, you know, uh, did what it set out to do. Um, you know, look at, you know, take a look at Europe today. Is it more or less religious than it was at the time of the Reformation? The obvious answer is no. Uh, you could judge something ultimately by its fruits. I think it failed. I have to pivot from that to this because I'm sure, again, I came back to this. Most of you, everything I've said about Luther, and you probably knew something about Luther already. Hopefully, some of you knew something about this. But the whole idea of sola fide and don't do good works. Um, I'm guessing virtually none of your Protestant friends believe anything like that. Why do I get B first instead of A? Um, let's start with A first. Um, <laughs> modern Protestantism is, of course, different because it changed a lot uh, from 1648 to now uh, in, a, in a whole host of different ways. Um, one of the reasons is that all this stuff about, you know, sola fide, about um, no good works, those sorts of things, basically outside of academic theologians, Protestant theologians, and pastors, and there are some. There's still Calvinists left. There's still hardline Lutherans. For the most part, I don't think most people in Protestant Jews believe that. Um, and part of the reason they don't is something that happens in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, the emergence of what's called Pietism in Germany, which spread um, to other places in uh, well, Europe and America, actually, kind of changed um, Protestantism in a big way. If you know what Pietism is, it's a... Um, it's an emphasis within Lutheranism, actually. It starts in the Lutheran churches in Germany, which de-emphasized doctrine. You know, okay, you know, all that stuff about so de-emphasized this, and emphasized two things: you know, personal morality, personal piety, ethics, but also uh, personal individual experience, particularly feelings, um, uh, having a strong emotional experience was a sign that you had a good relationship with God. This gets into uh, England uh, via John Wesley, the founder of the this church, who this is, Wesley and his uh, his companion George Whitfield go to the American colonies in the 1740s, and they you know, the first great awakening. This gets into America from uh, 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 in this period, and these and it starts a series of religious revivals. Which again, if you know anything about Protestantism, you probably have a more revivalistic form of it in your head. This is where it comes from eventually, uh, ultimately, and it really does reshape Protestantism and at a popular level. It's no longer about adherence, adherence to a confession, adherence to um, a particular type of religious inheritance. It becomes more about, well, like, frankly, emotion. Uh, it colors virtually, and by the way, most of the Catholic world, this happens eventually as well. Um, but it also, this is the other thing about it that's important, is that a lot of these movements, um, you get into the United States, the Methodists, the Baptists, when they become popular, a lot of them abandon traditional Calvinist theology because they put so much emphasis on personal experience and personal effort. Um, they go back around to um, a, 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 a view of faith that says, no, you should do good works. You do have a role to play, basically, uh, to a certain degree. And some of them don't, but for the most part, in a practical level, nobody really disputes the idea you need to do good works, in other words, to be saved. And so this has a real big, huge impact. I can't overstate it. It really makes a, a, a dividing line between early modern and modern forms of Protestantism. Particularly for America, one of the things that makes it different too is that you have, uh, from the beginning of the country after it becomes independent, and even before that, you have so many religious, so many Protestant denominations. Uh, again, it encourages people, especially in the post-revolutionary period, to sort of switch denominations, to a denomination hub. I know we have uh, converts in here probably. Uh, that's something that's fairly normal and common uh, among them. And that's, again, that's, that is kind of an American thing. It's kind of unique to a certain degree um, to American Protestantism, to not take the institutional side of it as, as, uh, 
um, as seriously as their European ancestors did. And finally, the other thing that makes it really different being here in America is that uh, not having an established state church in America, like Protestantism in a generic sort of way, was sort of still the sort of unofficial religion of the country. Uh, and sometimes you hear people talk about civic religion, the religion that upholds the state. Again, this goes back to this revivalistic mentality of a pietism, where people in the United States tend to see the church as a purely voluntary institution. It's just a matter of people, small groups getting together and banding together and starting groups and doing things on their own. And um, actually impressive in some ways, some of the things they did in the early part of the 19th century, but um, they worked to make it the sort of religion of the country. Uh, and so we didn't, my point is he had this mixing of Protestant uh, pietistic uh, Protestantism with Republican, I don't mean Republican Party, Republican ideology in the sense of the form of government that we had, uh, kind of fusing in the early part of our history, which is why for so many people there's not a real big dividing line between the United States and the country, and, and what they think of as Christianity. It's because of our peculiar nature of our country, because we didn't have that, that, um, that, uh, uh, um, um, State enforced religion that becomes this very different thing, which again emphasizes um, what I call voluntarism. It emphasizes your will. So you don't get a lot of that sort of sola fide stuff having a lot of purchase in this country. And then finally, does the Reformation still matter? Um, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, why does it still matter? Um, some of the conflicts we're having today within the church, they go back to the Reformation. Um, to give you a couple of examples, as I'm sure you know, um, there are debates about the liturgy uh, in the modern Catholic Church. Um, a lot of these go back to have precedence in debates about the liturgy uh, that uh, Protestant reformers had, uh, both amongst themselves and with Catholics in the 16th and 17th centuries. How elaborate should it be? Do we need to have it in Latin? Stuff like that. All those things, of course, were brought up by the reformers. Um, Another conflict, uh, and this goes back to Luther's idea of um, you know, not having free will, um, the idea of psychological fatalism, the idea that you can't, um, you can't do good work, you can't improve yourself, you can't be virtuous. Uh, Luther, uh, at one point, uh, after he ceases to be a monk, uh, basically says that chastity is impossible. No one can be chaste. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, we're having a big debate right now about uh, the nature of marriage and the Eucharist. Uh, and the idea of some people as well, people can't be chaste. They, you know, they can't do it, right? Uh, as if God wouldn't give you the grace to do that, right? It's a sort of, again, it's the same fatalistic understanding of, uh, well, if you can't do it, then you shouldn't be punished for it, right? Um, and never mind the fact that Jesus says, be you therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Never mind all the centuries of tradition that say otherwise. Um, it's a very, uh, these things are still with us in a lot of very direct ways. Um, secondly, it's important to understand the background uh, that our Protestant friends have in the faith. Again, most of your friends don't understand any of this probably, if they're Protestant, some of them do. Um, but it's good to know where they're coming from and you know, to be uh, a witness for them to your Catholic faith, it's good to know this. And I hope I haven't, uh, I'm glad I actually have, I admit I haven't, uh, I told you I was reading a biography of Luther. I haven't, but I used to read fairly deeply in the Reformation. I stopped uh, a long time ago, mainly because I didn't. Uh, it was hard to be charitable. Uh, think, uh, to be honest, I'd be thinking about Protestantism after I read it, I just like the guy so much. Um, you know, whatever you do when you witness the faith, do it charitably. Uh, I, nice, nice fellow. I have read this last book, which I it brought back everything I disliked about the man. I still feel like I got out of it. I'm still fairly charitable. I still. I still have good feelings toward my Protestant friends, so I, I grew, actually, that's, that's a good thing, right? Um, but it's important to know it for their sake. Uh, it is important to know it for their sake. Um, it's important to understand it and why the division still exists, uh, what the barriers are between that. Um, because, of course, uh, as I mentioned before, we still have the conflicts, we still have corruption in the church. Uh, one of the things you can take away from you know, the 16th century, and again, I don't mean to say everything Luther wanted was wrong, um, the way he went about it, the intemperate, the very angry. And again, I do have some sympathy with the man, but I've suffered from depression myself in my own life. And so I do have, uh, he, he did have something, some sort of emotional disorder, it was really bad. So you understand that aspect of his, his personality, his faith. Um, you understand there are certain things you can do as a Catholic to reform the church. 
Um, you shouldn't take it in certain directions. And so I think that's an important thing uh, to understand. And then finally, just more generally as an educated person, which I know you all are, uh, how it shaped the world you, world you live in. It still, again, it still has a direct impact on you in a lot of ways. You wouldn't think, I mean, 500 years old has a uh, direct impact on you. Um, uh, why not? The U.S. Constitution is 200 years old and has been a direct impact on you as well, but this as well, um, uh, I think, still impacts all of us. So, finally, a few takeaways. Um, again, uh, uh, much apologetic use, but um, I think for the most part, the Protestant reformers were well intended, even if they had, again, problems. Uh, these are movement, other, other world. I think they did want those things that were good. I think they wanted good things in the sense of, you know, one of this with the Bible, stuff like this. Um, but the means they used, uh, again, essentially disrupted the unity of the church, and they, and they failed. I, think, I, it was, I, think, I don't think, in fact, I know, I know of Protestant scholars who will admit this, it, it really was a failure uh, in the end. Um, their church needed reform, but destroying unity undermined any hope of that. Um, there's really no way, you know, you can't, um, you can't fix your marriage problems by abandoning your spouse. Um, that's the best analogy I can think of. Um, and then finally, you need to understand Protestant beliefs and, and your Catholic faith, by the way. I'm leaving that out for the purpose of this lecture. You should know that as well. Uh, if there's any uh, any other hope overcoming that division. Uh, yeah, I think I got done just about uh, uh, a lot longer than I thought I was going to take, unfortunately. But, um, but that is it. <laughs> that is the end of the lecture. <laughs> Thank you. I know, it's, I know it's late. And any questions that you have uh, after the talk that you want to sort of elaborate? Well, that was enough of me for, for an hour and a half. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the Anglican. Do you know about the Anglican Rite Mass? Yes, I attend one. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, the, uh, this is Our Lady of Sorrows Catholic Church. There is a parish uh, that meets here. Our parish is Our Lady of uh, Hope Catholic Church. And it is made up of former uh, Anglicans. And um, the former reason I, this is kind of an important talk for me. I'm not a former Anglican. <laughs> uh, I was an atheist before I became a Catholic, so I don't have that background. But um, if you don't know, uh, Pope Benedict XVI created a structure called the Novariate for groups of people from the Anglican tradition, the Church of England, to enter in, enter corporately into the Catholic Church as parishes. Uh, and we have one that meets here. Uh, 9.15 on Sundays, by the way, if you're interested. Uh, it's a beautiful church. Trust me, there's not many people there, so you'll have to be able to easily get a seat. Uh, but it takes from um, takes elements from the Church of England's liturgy, the Book of Common, Common Prayer, and integrates that with the, the Roman liturgy. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's done in what you might call Shakespearean English. So it has that sort of sound to it. But it's essentially the same mass otherwise. Yes, sir. Um, so would you say that the like the idea of separation of church and state is that would you say that that came out of the Protestant Reformation? And um, also, um, do you think that, that um, that's a good thing? Uh, uh, not directly, it didn't come out of it. I mean, it uh, it came out of the um, the conflict ultimately. I mean, people developed those ideas, and that's generally an Enlightenment idea, um, as a way of trying to contain conflict. That's essentially what that. That's essentially what that is. It was a the whole idea of separation of church and state is an ad hoc thing. Essentially, I don't think people got up in the morning saying, you know, it didn't become a principle until much later on. Is my point. As far as it being a good thing, it can be. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> yeah, I hate to say it, but it's anything. It's not. You know, um, that's kind of that's a weaselly answer, isn't it? No. It, 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 in some ways, it was good for the for the Catholic Church in the 19th century in times like that. Uh, when it was a, when they were a minority, it was, um, you know, but um, it, it, it kind of depends on who's applying it. I hate to say that, but um, odd in some ways were better under a, a very fairly intolerant Protestant country in some ways, but it just depends. I, I don't, I don't have a real strong feeling about like you know this is the best polity, this is the best sort of thing for the. There are big debates. Catholic eggheads like to debate this stuff. Was it better when we had like I, I don't know. That's not really. I want to get to heaven. Everything else is secondary. Um, um, I, I'll say I'll say this on balance. It's been I would say it's been a good thing for us in this country. 
it will continue to be another matter going forward, but I think it's I think it's been more or less a good thing. Ladies first. What's your name, by the way? Uh, I really enjoyed the lecture. Um, oh, thank you. I, I was curious um, among like maybe upcoming topics for you to consider the Great Schism. Is that right? Like, oh, you mean the um, the uh, schism with the Orthodox? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That we can do one of those. Yeah. I'm not trying to shelf all the good of that. Yeah. Uh, but I'll definitely consider. Yeah. If you have ideas, by the way, let me know on the Facebook page or after uh, a meeting or something like that. But absolutely. What's your name, by the way? I'm Lisa. I'm Lisa. 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 Okay. You have a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, I guess would you kind of. Um, there, there's um, uh, a really good historian, he's an academic historian, but he's also Catholic, his name is Brad Gregory. Uh, I saw him talk a couple of months ago, and he uh, wrote a big book arguing just that. Yeah, it was the Reformation, it was one of the big things that pushed it. I, I, I think it contributed to it. I, I don't, I'm not as convinced as he is that this is the sole, he, he put a lot of it. I don't, yes, but, uh, I mean, that's the thing is, I, I don't think it's the, but this way, in social terms, in, in social, cultural, I don't think it's the fount of all evils of Protestantism. My problem with Protestantism, I think it undermines people's, I think it's about, it's about salvation to me. That's the thing it really, that to me, is, in a spiritual sense, it's, it's much worse than in a social or cultural sense. There are actually better benefits from, you know, um, you know anything about South America, Latin America, like it's, there's a lot of, um, used to be really fully Catholic, now it's like large parts of South America have gone, you know, Pentecostal Protestantism. Some of these people, some of the, the moral effects it has on these people embracing this very, you know, say voluntaristic form of, of Protestantism is like they, the people, their, their, their moral lives improve a lot. Uh, and so the idea that, you know, the individual conscience and everything, I think is, is problematic to the least in a spiritual sense. The idea that you take responsibility for yourself, though, is actually can be a really good thing socially. So um, for things like individualism, stuff like that, it definitely contributed, it definitely did. Um, I, yeah, I'm kind of, I, I come down on the side that it's not the, not the most important thing, put it that way. You guys look tired. <laughs> it's late. If anybody has questions, they can come ask me. I'll let you guys go. If somebody need to go and everything. But thank you all for coming. Uh, bless your hearts. Please come back. I'd love to have you. Hope you got something out of it. If you have any questions, comments, critiques? Things you want to know, you didn't get a chance to get to know, let me know. I'll try to uh, get back to you. So, remember, controversies in church history on Facebook. Uh, someone has suggested I, I make my own website for it because I, I know people are friends with a lot on Facebook. But I don't know, we'll see. Uh, but uh, that is it. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'll see you guys in a month.